so here we are back again and as you can see I'm at my parents for a few weeks it is the end of second year and I thought I would do uh, a little video to kind of uh, wrap up second year as I did last year with uh, the first year probably not going to be as long as that one because although this year has been uh, more challenging in some respects Obviously, I don't need to cover everything. Obviously, I don't need to go into all the content. Uh, I don't need to explore uh, the nuances of the structure or anything like that because that's all included in, in last year's video if you want to go back and, and see it. Where I do want to start, though, is uh, by a statement made from my personal tutor uh, last year in first year, sort of coming towards the tail end of first year. She said to me, second year hits you like a train. And I may have stated this on a live stream or a video somewhere in the past. And um, I was, of course, intrigued by that statement. And I thought, potentially, uh, second year could be um, quite challenging indeed. Now, when I first got to uni and the first few weeks and this seem to be the sentiment on the group chat as well because I have a group chat on Facebook or, or I should say it's not my group chat but I'm included in the group chat um, with uh, practically the entire second year of uh, undergraduate psychology students so it's a huge group chat and you know there's various discussions that go on in there about assignments and exams and uh, general stuff as well and, and, and general feelings about the course and stuff and it seemed that the, the overall sentiment for the first few weeks or the first couple of months was fairly okay everyone was happy uh, as you'll see in a few minutes the the content the, the the modules were were brilliant and they're what a lot of people well some of them at least are what a lot of people would characterize as what modern psychology is and uh, so I had already looked at the modules with my flatmates uh, a few months prior to, to coming back to uni in September and uh, in fact we had looked at them back in back in April and uh, they were really interesting and I was excited and my flatmate who's doing psychology was excited and um, so, of course, you know, uh, those first few weeks or that first couple of months of uh, uh, first semester were, were good. The sentiment was good generally from people. And I was thinking, you know, it hits you like a train. I don't know what that is, is about at all because that's not been my experience so far. Anyway, the assignments come along and, you know, you just do as you do. You're getting on with the work. You, you doing the lectures and all the rest of it and of course as usual I'm doing my side projects when I can and um, and again you know it seems okay it seems all right but it does slowly start to get um, a little bit harder you know it does slowly start to get uh, as if things are uh, you know are coming coming on top but it wasn't really until maybe very late on that semester you know, coming around to handing in the research report for research methods, um, coming in to, to handing in a few more assignments and stuff, that I really, you know, I, I was starting to feel it. I was thinking, oh, yeah, I can I can, I can understand uh, why my personal tutor would have said that. And, and other people on the group, the sentiment was becoming, uh, you know, a little bit more uh, like, oh, you know, it's, it's getting tougher. And some people had thought it was tougher a little bit prior to that. Um, but certainly around sort of that December time people people were saying that and we did have an assignment to do over Christmas as well And we also had to revise for, for the exams. So naturally, you know people in the group were saying um, You know that we're feeling it a little bit And then the exams come, came around and and of course exact as exam period always feels to a lot of people and for me included um, It always seems to drag it's only a two-week period but because you're doing all your revision every day and you've, you've done your revision for, for a week or two prior to that or maybe a little bit longer, a little bit shorter and depending on your temperament and your discipline and all the rest of it. But for me, normally only a week or two before I start revision and that seems to have worked for me thus far. 
so that's what I do and uh, so then of course you after the exam period uh, you feel quite um, relieved or kind of just quite um, I don't know exactly what the word but kind of you get a, a boost of energy because it's been such a, a, a long period it's felt that way um, sort of like in a sense psychological relativity you know uh, there's that famous quote from Einstein where he said uh, it's something like uh, you can sit on hot coals for two hours uh, for, for two minutes and it can feel like two hours but you can be with an attractive girl for two minutes uh, uh, wait you can be with an attractive girl for two hours and it feels like two minutes yeah that's, so it's kind of like you know there's a bit of psychological relativity that goes on with that but um, yeah so it, it it does feel like that and you get to the end and you think uh, oh wow you know glad that's done so again there was a bit of a, a kind of uh, sense of uh, things becoming tougher and again that was the general sentiment then we get into second semester and again brilliant modules I'll show you in a minute and it was uh, it, you know thank God the content was was really good all year because you can imagine if the content wasn't good and it's slowly getting harder and harder, um, it would be a lot, well, it would be a lot harder to stomach. It'd be a lot harder to uh, um, to move on with and to kind of find interest and to hook on to and to, and to keep going with. So uh, what was brilliant is, of course, that. And uh, then what I found in second semester is... There was a little bit more work, particularly in one of the modules. We uh, the way in which it was formatted was very, very odd. It, 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 to give you an idea, you basically had to do double the amount of work because of the way the assignments and the exams were were structured. Um, it was very bizarre why they did that and for me personally for a 10 credit module there's either modules that are 20 credits or, or 10 credits and for a 10 credit module i thought that uh it was pushing it a bit and 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 i didn't feel like the structure was um you know when we're thinking in a in a feeling emotional manner you know because when we think of that jungian feeling type of of um uh, of I suppose kind of being in harmony with the emotional needs and the emotional uh, side of, of education which which of course has been such a, uh, a ridiculous thing recently with regards to COVID and things like that but also just generally in the 21st century with, with mental health and, and student well-being as well and particularly um, uh, things like harmonizing student resilience um, we've also trying to to continue to get a, a, a strong level of well-being there because sometimes you know students might be able to be resilient but they sacrifice some of their mental well-being and, and things like that and of course you've got varying different degrees of ability at university it's not just that you've got superstars it's not just that you've got uh, you know if we're, if we're being unkind you could say dunces or whatever you've got a full spectrum of ability where uh, it, it ranges from uh, one side all the way up to the other with everything in between all manner of personal circumstances going on over a time period etc so I felt with that particular one module um, that it could have been structured and it could have been logistically and um, in terms of uh, getting the work done etc getting the amount of work done that's necessary it could have been uh, structured in a much uh, more let's say fluid way shall we say or a way that's flowing and that, that um, doesn't necessarily put as much pressure on people especially considering we've got four of the mod modules c to contend with that sort of stuff um, so of course second semester it really ramped up and this was again uh, a general sort of sentiment especially around Easter just before Easter during Easter and after Easter 
um, that was real sentiment. It was, you know, wow, we've got a lot to do. Um, and I was feeling it and other people were feeling it as well. And uh, and then, of course, we've just had the exams. And that has seemed to be in... We've had five exams this time, not, not the four last time. Just the way it's worked out with the module structure. And uh, again, as exam period normally is, as I mentioned, that was a, uh, a long period. Um, and of course, I noticed on the group, actually, uh, I'm recalling here, uh, that there were a few people who, who had said, wow, you know, this, uh, these exams, you know, they, they just continue, etc. Um, but yeah, we're at the end of the year now. And what I, what I will do now is I'll run through some of the modules and then you'll be able to see how, although it was harder this year, and that is the general theme running through this video, I suppose, with regards to, uh, you know, in comparison to last year. At least it feels uh, a little bit harder this year. It's felt like there's been a bit more, uh, a little bit more load on us. Uh, I don't know whether it feels harder because, of course, uh, I don't know whether any of you will know, but we are in, well, maybe, maybe I have said, I probably have said before, but we are in in-person lectures aside from... Uh, or opposed to uh, the online lectures that we had all year last year. Now, I don't know, because I've gone through this in my mind a few times, I don't know whether the in-person lectures uh, have helped motivation or hindered motivation. I would probably say, I mean, I suppose I'm speaking about myself here. If I were to speak about the general uh, psychology year, the psychology cohort, um, I would say that most people would say it's a help. It's been it's been a benefit to have uh, in person lectures. But for me, it's been, I've, I've tried to understand, you know, from from a psychological viewpoint. Cause of course, I'm doing psychology. It's kind of a, a little bit meta, isn't it? Because I'm thinking about psychology, how the structure of a psychology course and what I'm learning about in psychology has uh, affected aspects of psychology that are going on within me and, and, and others and stuff so it's quite interesting but uh, I like to do that so um, it's uh, yeah so I've been back and forth but I think I would have to say for me personally and I would say for a year um, that it's been more of a help for motivation than than something that uh, is let's say hinders us more than than the the online lectures um, what I was finding and what a lot of other people were finding with the online lectures uh, was this kind of tiredness. And I don't know whether that's to do with looking at a screen for X amount of time, whether it's because there's not, uh, you know, that sort of extroverted stimulation there. I, I don't know. Um, but that's what I was finding. And you do, you do of course, get kind of a, a tiredness, a fatigue within in-person lectures. But I think you're more willing and you do end up concentrating a lot more because you are there, you are in the room. Um, so, so of course, there's that. But what I'll do now, save uh, going off on one, talking some more, I will read out the uh, semester one and semester two uh, modules. And I won't really touch upon them too much. I might give you a very brief idea of what was in them. Uh, and then you might understand why, uh, you know, I say that these modules are interesting. And, and in particular, with a few of these modules, what you'll know, even just by the title, is there is a level of popular psychology in these modules. Uh, there is a level of that stereotypical bias that, that, that the general public have towards psychology. And yes, I am talking about, you know, the whole Freudian couch thing things like Freudian slips and all, you know, and, and coming into popular psychology or um, things that are, of course, very well known by, by the general population. Um, uh, but also I'm talking about uh, other things as well and, and kind of things like um, mental disorders, like one of these modules you'll see in a minute includes um, a great deal of, of information from the DSM-5, which is 
the diagnostic and statistics manual for, for mental disorders and um, and that involves anxiety, depression, schizophrenia, things like that. That nowadays, when you say to someone psychology, of course they get that that image of the Freudian couch, but second to that, maybe even first, or maybe even simultaneously, but but probably more so second, is anxiety, depression, things like that, schizophrenia, those kind of things come to mind now with people. Um, so I will go through these. So we have in semester one was social psychology. Uh, we had personality and individual differences. We had behavioral psychology. We had aspects of clinical psychology and we had research methods. And as I said, research methods is your statistics and your SPSS and that's a through line throughout uh, the first year and second year. In the third year, you don't do research methods, but you do have your dissertation of which there is a component of statistics within an SPSS. So, uh, of course, it is somewhat of a through line for through the entire degree. Um, so social psychology, uh, that was very, very interesting, and it kind of bridged on uh, anthropology, actually, uh, and uh, really interesting ideas of the social environment and I remember we did one particularly fascinating lecture uh, on attraction and love in fact I think the attraction and love uh, ones may have been two separate lectures it might have been one lecture or it might have been two separate but very very fascinating uh, particularly with regards to the different theories of love and stuff and we went right back to the Greeks and did uh, the various different forms of love there, um, I want to say agape, um, eros, um, mana, the, the, uh, or mania, or whatever, there's, there's literally about seven of them, uh, really, really interesting, um, there's also kind of like a, a, a brotherly or, or, sister, or sisterly love, um, and again, that can tie in with, with agape in, in a sense, uh, although agape is not what people think it's and, and I know I'm getting the pronunciation wrong don't you worry it's, it's terrible but um, yeah it's not what people think I think there's much more depth to that concept that people think I think there's much more spiritual depth to that concept that than people think or or if you don't want to say spiritual then uh, a particular psychological depth because these things are, are interchangeable anyway um, but nonetheless, there is a, a very strong uh, um, uh, depth to get to that concept. So that was a really interesting uh, module, and, and we did loads of stuff. We did the Nazi atrocities. We did all sorts of other different atrocities. Um, we did, um, what is it, Milgram or Milgram experiments, where he did the electric shocks and all that. We did all this sort of stuff. Heuristics. You name it, we did a, a lot of stuff in that. Um, personality and individual differences. Uh, this was one that I was very much looking forward to. Uh, and I knew going in that we wouldn't do much at all on Freud and Jung. So personality and individual differences is your Freud, Jung, Adler, your trait psychology, uh, your... Um, uh, you know, along with your trait psychology, big five and stuff like that. You, I never know how to pronounce it, but you, you just salt psychology. That that's not how you pronounce it again. Um, things like that, all sorts of stuff like that. Um, we did a little bit on um, genetics, hereditability, and uh, male uh, male female sex differences and things like that. Uh, or, or I don't know whether it's better to use the terms man woman i always forget which way around that is but um yeah so we, we did a little bit of that um uh, and that was very very interesting specifically for, for myself as well um so yeah that that was really really interesting but we didn't do as much on freud and young as uh, i would have liked and of course that was going to be the case but what we did do is we did have a um, an assignment that was either on the topic of Freud, Jung, or Adler. So that was really good. Of course, I did Jung, um, and uh, it was really nice to know 
that we had an assignment based around that and that it that it wasn't just a one hour lecture on that person and it really it was a one hour lecture on that person we did about an hour on Freud an hour on Jung an hour on Adler that was it which in my view is horrendous you know you should do about you do at least about five hours on Freud or something then you know a good well really obviously with my persuasion I would say a lot more on Jung but you know let's say five hours on Jung and then maybe a little bit less on Adler um, but nonetheless you know around that uh, certainly not one hour on Adler you do more than that but um, you know that that would be about right and then you do an assignment that's on maybe one of the three or two of the three or something like maybe a contrasting assignment now we our assignment was a thousand words long normally our assignments are 1500 so it was a little bit lower this one so that was good and uh, uh, but nonetheless if let's say you were doing it in the way uh, that I'd proposed there if you were doing a contrasting assignment between one of them, maybe upping that assignment to 1,500 words would be a, a good option to get the room, you know, to get the word count, to be able to compare and contrast. And I think that that comparing and contrasting really does solidify someone's knowledge and really does help to kind of... Um, uh, to elucidate and to understand the theory inside their own mind a lot, a lot more clearly. So it was okay that we managed to do an assignment on on one of them. That was something a little bit extra that I wasn't expecting. But I, of course, I was not expecting a lot uh, on on those those three in there. But you know that that's just how it is. Behavioral psychology. So I did uh, behaviorism last year in first year. And so I will have touched upon that in last year's video. Of course, there are things in there like uh, reinforcement, punishment, extinction, shaping, chaining, stuff like that. But also we learnt about um, schedules of reinforcement. We learnt about more the kind of practical application of behaviourism. I'd say more so this year than, than last year. Um, we learnt about sort of I suppose you wouldn't call them case studies, but but our lecturer kind of talked through some of the things she's done in the past. Um, of course, they're not official case studies, but uh, they're cer certainly um, anecdotes and certainly kind of uh, experiences that she's had in the past that uh, were, were really valuable. Um, and uh, we did one particular le lecture as well on misattribution as a behavioral um as tied with behavioral concepts within the realm of superstition and i found that very very interesting um and i did do a bit of thought on that for you know during the lecture and, and after the lecture and because of course i was trying to tie it not only with behaviorism but jungian concepts and, and other things that i know and uh uh, so, so that was really, really interesting, and we did. Uh, I believe it was in that same superstition lecture. Uh, we did about witches uh, and things like that, uh, and the witch trials, and and again, kind of, I suppose, semi looking at, at those from a behavioural perspective, and so, so that was interesting. Uh, for here, obviously, aspects of clinical psychology, that uh, was very. I don't want to use the word hard particularly, but it was very, very content rich. And I, I say that in both a positive and negative way. It's, it's a negative because of just the volume of content, but it's a positive because, you know, it really was a rich topic and you could really get your teeth into it. And uh, with regards to all the, the different mental disorders, you know, from the DSM-5, You've got anxiety in there. Of course, obviously, anxiety is split down into various different disorders. It's not just, there isn't necessarily a disorder called anxiety. It's generalized anxiety disorder or panic disorder or, or whatever, social anxiety disorder. Um, but, you know, anxiety, depression, uh, schizophrenia, schizotypal personality disorder, schizoid personality disorder, um, specific phobia, um, obsessive compulsive disorder, all manner you know all your manner of stuff your 
what many, many people would consider your, your bread and butter of, well, certainly your bread and butter of clinical psychology, but what I suppose a, a general person would consider the bread and butter of psychology, you know, of, or of a psychologist. Um, and, and so we did, we did all that sort of stuff in there. And that was really um, interesting because we did, uh, and this is, I suppose, why the reason I say it was, uh, you know, it was, there was a lot in there is because we did the all of these different clusters of disorders like cluster A, cluster B, cluster C. We did the breakdown based on etiology, you know, genetic factors, socialized factors, all that sort of stuff. We did all your symptoms of each one. And bear in mind, you know, there's a fair handful of disorders here. Then aside from that, in certain lectures, we did, we did other stuff as well. Um, and, and so it was, it, you know, it, it was fairly heavy and of course when you're uh, doing that based on the specific diagnostic criteria um, it, it has got to be pretty precise and also it's got to be pretty expansive or comprehensive would be a better word to use so uh, that was um, fairly uh, fairly rich and, and that of course is both a positive and negative. And then research methods I won't go into because that's just your statistics. It's just your, your, your stuff like that. So semester two, I don't think I went through these in a kind of uh, overview way. So I'll do the same. I'll, I'll go over these in a very quick overview and then I'll, I'll break them down briefly as well. So we had in semester two, developmental psychology, concepts in psychology, biological psychology, cognitive psychology, and then research methods again. So developmental psychology does what it says on the tin or is what it says on the tin. The development of, uh, well, our psychologies through childhood. Um, and, and that includes Piaget. Uh, it includes, uh, you know, here and there a little bit of uh, neurophysiology, you know, neuroanatomy, stuff like that. A little bit of... Um, you know, there was, well, there was one lecture on a bit of like embryology and stuff like that and the child growing in the womb and uh, the phases in which can can really, really have negative effects on the child uh, if, let's say, um, a pregnant woman was to drink or to do drugs or whatever. Um, and, you know, there was, there was things like that in there. But also there was, there was a lot of emphasis on... Uh, cognition and there was a lot of emphasis on theory of mind and how theory of mind m may develop uh, there was a lot of emphasis on things you know I suppose tied to that in some regard self-awareness uh, there was things on Vygotsky there was things on uh, Rousseau uh, there was things uh, again this is more of a historical attitude I suppose there was uh, things on Locke as well because in a way if you look at Locke and Rousseau, they are like uh, historical um, antecedents, in a way, to Piaget and Vygotsky. It, you know, I mean, there's, there's certain parallels there. So Rousseau being more like Piaget, uh, Locke being more like uh, Vygotsky. Um, and, and so, you know, there was bits of that in there. Uh, there was a little bit on like the, I suppose, the development of lying and stuff like that, or, or children not being particularly truthful and stuff like that, um, and you know all sorts of manner of stuff like that. So it was a real, you know, again, it was another, it was another rich field actually. Um, so next one was concepts in psychology. Bit of an obscure name. I didn't know what to expect. I didn't know what it was going to be. Uh, turns out that it was one of my favourite modules this semester, um, and we did the history of psychology in the setting of philosophy. So we went right the way back to Aristotle and Plato and people like that. Um, then, we, of course, coming forward, we went into the Renaissance and the scientific revolution, and we, we touched upon philosophers and scientists and mathematicians, and then, of course, you know, your, your physiologists and then your, your psychologists or your, your psychiatrists, um, your psychoanalysis, psychoanalysts and all that. So we did a real big span. Like a, It was almost the first part of that module, first few weeks, was almost a historical dump, a historical um, uh, 
a continuum of stuff that, that we were learning. And it was fascinating for me uh, with regards to the philosophical element. And we touched upon empiricism and rationalism and uh, oh my god, we touched upon ph uh, phrenology and stuff like that. And uh, we, we touched upon uh, spiritualism in psychology, you know, briefly here and there. Uh, oh my god, we touched upon so much that it, it was the lectures were a hundred slides long each, uh, practically every week, um, and they were so rich that no one could imagine to, to contain all of the knowledge in them, but nonetheless, they were I was overwhelmed, it was, it was exactly up my street. Uh, we also did uh, scientific method, we also did brain physiology, I mean you can just see the scope of this one module. We also did brain physiology, brain anatomy, uh, all sorts of that, like a, basically a re recap from last year. We really did the rounds on, on that module, really. Then on the last lecture we did ethics and we did sort of a bit of a history of ethics as well so it was a real real module that one uh next was biological psychology so that is again i mean i've just touched upon it there brain anatomy uh brain physiology uh even neurotransmitter um all stuff like that you know the uh, psychopharmacology all that sort of stuff um uh central nervous system you know uh cutaneous receptors all that loads of stuff i mean obviously cutaneous receptors i think are in the peripheral nervous system not the central nervous system but you get that you know it's that sort of stuff so um yeah you know real again that one was really really rich uh probably either my favorite or second favorite module biological psychology of the the, the five this semester I would say that's fairly typical. I'd say a lot of people liked biological psychology. Uh, very, you know, uh, although it was hard, it is hard, but it's very matter of fact and it's very like, ah, there we are. That's exactly how it is. And me being me, the way my brain works, I like that. I like it to be, you know, ah, you know, well, you know, it's matter of fact. It's, uh, you know, there's no getting out of this. It's scientific. And I like it when it's scientific. I like it when it's duh, that, you know. And, of course, um, uh, I have great room for uh, spiritual concepts. And I have great room for um, uh, thinking about things in a very mystical and, uh, and, and very wild manner. And, and that gives me great passion. Uh, but when you can unify the two, that's the real thing. If you can unify the science with the spirituality and go like, boom, then you're like, wow, I can have the best of both worlds here. I can eat, I can have my cake and eat it. I can say, well, there's a scientific, scientifically valid thing for this, which is very, very good. And then there's a, um, a uh, you know, there's a spiritual element that is a subjective element that actually incorporates brilliantly into that and there are a lot of things within science that you can do that for of course most people don't do that or don't see that because well you know most scientists are either scientists or uh, are most spiritual people are spiritual people of course as more so in the 21st century there is now becoming this uh, breed of person shall i say particularly among psychologists particularly among uh, philosophers a little bit less so in physicists but still there's some of these people in physicists um, who are uh, scientific spiritualists shall we say where they can see this unification um, and I would say that's really been possible through the philosophers and psychologists of the 20th century who were making real valid attempts to unify these things. Um, and that could be considered uh, Jung, that could be considered Alan Watts, that could be considered, I suppose, to a degree, Ter Terence McKenna and people like that, uh, although maybe less so there. Um, and what has kind of come 
from this kind of opening up of science to spirituality is a a new form of scientific atheism that is you know obviously a lot of people call it secular spirituality and things like that um but also transcendent of that in as if kind of secular spirituality is a part of this bigger phenomenon um it's as if there is this new form of scientific understanding of religion that is almost beyond religion or science itself. It's very, it's very hard to explain because it's not religion and yes it is science to a degree but it's almost as if religion is unified with science and now there is just this one particular thing that you could consider as science hyphen religion with religion being the poetic explanation of science and science being the objective and matter of fact explanation of religious ideas um, and you only need to look into Taoism or Hindu cosmology or anything like that and then unify that with uh, things in physics for example quantum foam or something like that um, or you could unify Taoist ideas with oscillation in you know harmonic oscillation or something like that in, in quantum physics um, and of course wave particle duality being the obvious one that everyone talks about or complementarity or something like that um, all of the, these types of things um, uh, you know again that's specifically complementarity wave particle duality things like the yin and yang and stuff um, and so you have this weird thing where religion for thousands of years has been describing poetically or should we say subjectively or slightly more subjectively uh, those things that modern science refers to objectively but really they're just the same thing um, but it takes quite a lot of thinking and understanding to really get to that and to really think okay right yeah that that's that's as it as it can be um so yeah biological psychology anyway that is really really interesting and and sort of tying that into this yin and yang thing and stuff like this um agonists and antagonists in terms of um uh i don't know uh, receptors neurotransmitter receptors all that sort of stuff um they tie in with with things like non-duality quite quite easily you know it's not i mean you look at if you want to think about non-duality you, you go straight to the brain don't you know go 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 to physics and go to the brain because they're the two where if you go to physics then you'll get a lot of non-duality in physics if you go to the brain you'll get a lot of non-duality in the brain and uh, it's all there you know and, and, and that's the the Taoist that's the Taoist religion or the Taoist shall we say more so the Taoist philosophy um, so you know it's all there uh, and then the more you learn with these things the more you realize that you know it's all just science religion and there's nothing to say on the matter you know it's like the further and further science goes the further and further it'll it'll just end up uh being in line with with certain of these uh older religious con concepts um and so it's kind of like this rat race it's kind of like well is there a point to continuing to do that when you just go further and further in uh, and you get these uh, more complex variations or even let's say in some circumstances more simple variations but that just align to these very archaic ideas that we've all known about anyway you know it does make you think it makes you think well is there any point to that but you know people like progression and maybe it's a good thing so may as well go for it uh, what, el what else are we going to do really you know we're going to just sit around here doing nothing saying well mm -hmm. we've completed it now we've looked at the brain we've looked at physics we've looked at this and you know we're 99.999% certain that the Taoists were right it's the yin and yang it's that sort of thing let's just chill 
you know, let's have a Dionysian party for the rest of our existence. No one's going to really go for that, and the logistics of that would be absolutely terrible um, because someone would have to not have a party and would have to clean up all the time. So, so there you go, you know. Um, but anyway, so, so biological, that's that. Uh, cognitive psychology, really, really interesting. Again, a very, very deep or, or uh, what you could say, quite, quite challenging, heavy module. Um, uh, we did all sorts in that, you know, all sorts of theories of cognition, uh, memory, uh, uh, the way in which we process visual information, auditory information. Again, a kind of recap on uh, brain anatomy. In fact, last semester we did three modules around brain anatomy, um, and, and to be honest, there was a lot of overlap. You know, we, if the the tutors had talked to each other, uh, they might have been able to get the overlap down a little bit because there was a, a good bit of overlap. But yeah, loads of stuff in cognitive psychology, really, really interesting. Particularly uh, of interest is is the working memory model. Uh, that's really really good you know the central ex executive the phonological loop all of that sort of stuff visio spatial sketch pad that is a really nice model it's, it is really nice clean model i would say um i'm sure there's updates that could be done but it's a nice it's a nice little model um uh and and so yeah all sorts of stuff all manner of stuff with that and that, that was very very interesting and then research methods again, uh, and that is us done. And uh, there we go. You know, as I say, research methods is just your general statistics. So, so that's that. So overall, um, it's been an interesting uh, year. It's been a, a difficult year. It's had its challenges. It's had its ups and downs. Um, but nonetheless, it's it's been good. You know, it's been it's been interesting. And I, among with all the other psychology students have learned a lot, you know, and, and we have been exposed to a lot of new information and a lot of new knowledge. And and particularly, it's helped me no end with regards to understanding Jung, uh, understanding uh, kind of, I would say, my own writing, you know, my own side projects. And um, although I wouldn't have expected this, it's actually helped me in my poetry. Because I've managed to, uh, by learning certain things in psychology and certain things about biology and stuff like that, I've been able to incorporate into my psychology new, uh, a kind of a level of freshness. Into my psychology, I mean into my poetry, uh, a kind of freshness. Um, and that's been really, really cool. That's been really uh, interesting to be able to put things in there and I kind of like put little uh, uh, they're not really easter eggs I suppose but little scientific or psychological concepts in the poetry where they fit exactly um, so then it, it, it still works as being poetry and being subjective and, and, and evoking kind of some sort of emotion but being able to just put those little phrases in there or little words in there, it's been interesting. It and because I've always been very uh, concerned with this idea in poetry of being unique, of not of doing something different than you know the romantics, William Wordsworth and William Blake and all that sort of stuff, or. Uh, even uh, Edward Lear or Dr. Zeus or someone like that, uh, which they had their own unique style. They had different things that they were doing. Or someone like Charles Bukowski or, um, I don't know, Edgar Allan Poe or Oscar Wilde or any of these people, shall we say, any of these poets. Um, they all had similar styles or different styles you know you, you could group some of them together but what my ideas are is about trying to bring something new to poetry and that is damn hard i have had a lot of trouble with that i've had uh, uh it, it's been well i mean i've been doing poetry now for probably just over three years and in that time 
there's been many, many times where I've changed what I've done to try and get something new, to try and bring something new out of it. And um, it seems to me that if you can bring to it something unique in the context of your own experience and own knowledge, not just experience, but knowledge, and, and linguistically thread that together, that evokes this kind of certain emotionality and emotional experience that's that's different, unique, quirky even maybe. That's that can be a through line to some level of of uniqueness in poetry in the twenty first century that isn't just the same old prose. That isn't just the same old rhyming poetry or nonsense literature that isn't just the romanticism but it isn't just this same stuff but is something unique and different of itself a new subfield of poetry shall we say uh that is itself still very emotionally valid i would say because you could you can easily and i've done this many times myself kind of try out different styles of poetry and yes they can be different and unique but it's it's not got that quintessential poetry of what poetry should be shall we say so that's a trap that I've got into numerous times um uh, but what does generally happen is things come out of that that are positive and 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 to use a, a, a Jungian phrase you kind of get this unconscious circambulation within your work, uncon- you know, literally unconsciously for your work, that then slowly brings you to a place of 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 uh, uh, of a unique or idiosyncratic version of, uh, you know, in this case, poetry, that then could be turned into or that could represent a new angle or new sub branch to poetry which is a value you know this is the the biggest thing i think in life uh is value i think that is the biggest thing uh that you can provide in life value now what does it mean to provide value does it mean just something objective does it mean uh, doing something in the world that's very, very practical and that gives objective value to people's lives. Does it mean something subjective? So it evokes positive emotion in in people and that people get worth out of that and people get value out of that moment. Um, the fact is value or giving value means all of these things. It means And it means so much more. And... I am personally trying to give value in a holistic way. And at the moment, I feel like I'm giving little value or I'm giving value merely in a, shall we say, a passive way. You could even say, to some degree, a subjective way. And what I do eventually want to do is start to bring what you could say you know, Marx would say, like, philosophers are here to change the world and things like that, to to act. Um, And so I do want to provide more of an objective, practical value alongside this more subjective, passive value, which you could say comes into the experience of listening to music or the experience of reading a poem, which you get this sense of happiness and elation and that's a passive uh, or, or a subjective form of, of value, but that is nonetheless uh, very important because it's those those experiences in a way that define the bigger experiences in our life. And you could say this from a causal perspective, or you could say this from a uh, you know more of a, a, a being, a perspective of of, of just being, um, in which. Uh, someone might have a particular experience of watching someone when they're a child and they get this real sense of um, 
evoking emotion and and they really have a a, a bind to this experience or a, sorry a bond I should say to this experience and um, and it's that that can be as I say whether causally or even just in a sense of, of just your being and the feelings and the, the stuff that you have within you it can be that uh, that can be very very so so uh, it could be so important when you look back on your life having uh, let's say been someone who's who's made it to a, an incredibly high position in your field this is why people say uh, don't be on uh, when we're on TV shows or something they they recite these anecdotes of when we were a kid and when we listened to this person on the TV or something and and they say that that you know that really touched me that really inspired me that really got me so value although some people would say it's perfectly objective and it's about the practical things that you do in the world you know you could say uh I don't know what you could say. You could say um, building something or inventing something or doing something like that and, uh, uh, you know, inventing computers or whatever it may be. Although a lot of people would like to say that that's the sole real value, and to some degree I would as well, uh, but we have to contend with this idea that there's value in uh, these emotional experiences that either lead us causally speaking to these uh let's say great accomplishments or simply sit with us in our being and and our our powerful and our value that way um so there's of course different ways of, of, in which you can look at look at it and of course these things can be can be linked together as well um but anyway i'll leave it there for this video we've, we've probably been an hour or so um so that was my second year at university doing a uh, bsc in psychology uh that is straight psychology by the way that's not with uh clinical psychology or it's not with uh neuroscience or anything like that it's just straight psychology um of course if you are on any of those different streams you don't do the uh more f the things that are more oriented towards your particular stream uh, in until third year anyway so the first two years even if you're on psychology with clinical and health or psychology with neuroscience uh they're exactly the same content as the straight psychology degree um with regards i suppose i should wrap up and and, and really this is just more of a a note to myself or a kind of log a video a, literally a video log uh, for me um, is I of course I do want to do my masters uh, but I do not know what's particularly going to be the case with that at the moment I am still thinking about it. I'm aware that time will slowly ever press on uh, and I will of course need to come to make a decision at some point um, but I'm not sure whether to go down the route of doing a uh, master's in philosophy, uh, a master's in kind of, I suppose, straight psychology, a master's in psychology or clinical health, or a master's in potentially neuro neuroscience or something like that. It may very well be the case that I decide to stick on with uh, a master's degree in straight psychology. That might be a decent option um, but if I choose to go for philosophy it really does have to be at master's level because I feel as if if I go to if I end up doing a PhD which may or may not happen I do not know but if I end up doing a PhD uh, having done four years university level in psychology BSc and a master's then transition into philosophy at PhD would be a total, uh, it'd be very difficult, very, very challenging, very new. Um, so if I do transition to philosophy, I've got to make the decision um, to do it at, at master's. And then if I want to do a PhD, I'd, I'd then do a PhD in philosophy. Um, I am still not certain at the moment. Um, but yeah. 
that that is that so i mean i'm i'm trying to give you some information but my mind is blank i don't know I, there's there's many different options there those are the options that, that i've got um and i will more than likely take one of them uh of course there is another option as well there's many options i've got options galore um but uh, you know these are the kind of the, the general options shall we say uh, the other option would be uh something like to study psychology and philosophy at, at masters uh but i would rather take one or the other um and there is a reason for that it's because if i'm doing philo if i'm doing psychology um then i uh can get my bps accreditation if i do you know my my master's master of science degree in in psychology i can get my uh british psychological society accreditation and all that sort of stuff whereas if i did a psychology and philosophy unified degree uh joint degree i probably wouldn't with that degree get bps accreditation so i'd rather just go either psychology masters or philosophy masters and that's that or of course whatever the sub uh, masters degrees with psychology are as i mentioned just a minute ago so um yeah that's that so i will leave it there thank you very much for watching guys and i will see you in the next one so see you very soon mm -hmm.